Are you a boring, schleppy man who for some reason has so many younger, hotter women chasing after you that you have to violently shove the leftovers off a cliff? If so, then you just might be in a movie from Adam Sandler's production company, Happy Madison. Just like the movie we're going to be reviewing today called The Wrong Missy on Netflix. This film stars David Spade, Lauren Lapkus, and so many cameos from Adam Sandler's friends that it feels like you're at your dad's cookout. But at the heart of this story is a man who loves love, and by love, Love, I mean objectifying women and acting hatefully towards them. If you're looking for lovable characters or memorable comedy, you've come to the wrong party. But if you're looking for a film that's going to completely obliterate the low standards we have for men in this society, then we've got the perfect viewing experience. Stay tuned. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel. I wanted to see if my shoulder could touch both ends of the frame before we even get started. And I almost fall out of the chair. This is another installment of Clip Breakdown, the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies and least favorite cinematic nightmares to see what's wrong, what's up, what could be better, who's inside the celluloid. First, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more Clip Breakdowns just like this. It's a great way to support my channel, so thank you. But most importantly, if you're new here, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here because you know I'm giving you two videos every week, baby. So make sure you turn on notifications. That way you'll always be right here with me when we break bread over these bad films. <sighs> and today we've got a doozy. I watched The Wrong Missy, which is about an hour and a half long and it came out on Netflix recently. It's right now in the top 10. Basically, it's about a man who accidentally texts the wrong person and invites them on a romantic Hawaiian getaway that is also somehow also a business trip also. Also, also. Watching this movie made some of the things that I've always hated about Happy Madison productions come to the forefront because normally those movies have at least a few more bright spots than this one when it comes to actually being funny. That being said, there were a couple jokes in this movie where I was like, okay, that was funny. But Happy Madison has been making movies and TV since 1999. By this point, they should be better at it. Instead, what we've seen from Happy Madison and Adam Sandler vehicles, although he's not in this movie, you will see plenty of cameos from his family. What we've seen from him and his production is just a steady decline in how funny it is, how original it feels, and even like the stereotypes that they portray have just continued to get more narrow. It's not like any of these movies in the past have ever been super PC, but now it's like just devoid of all joy. Just like me in my body. Ooh, by the way, I'm wearing a shirt from Ripped Apparel, which uh, you can see more from them in the links below. The movie starts with David Spade who plays our main character, Tim, showing up to a nice restaurant where there's a little mix-up and he approaches the wrong woman at the bar because his blind date, who we later find out is Missy, is playing a prank on him where she's like deliberately causing this scene. Right off the bat, we can tell that Missy is like crazy. She's played by Lauren Lapkus, who I know mostly from Jurassic World and Orange is the New Black. And she's funny in this movie. She plays this character well. It's really the male characters in this movie that I cannot stand. We've heard enough from these white men, these straight white men making movies. What? Give your money to somebody else for a change. Lauren Lapkus, she plays Missy, who is like an out of this world, quirky character. But even then, it doesn't make sense that she's attracted to David Spade. Like, Lauren Lapkus is hot, she's in her 30s, David Spade is 56, I think. But they try to write off that whole age gap really quickly. By the way, the age thing doesn't concern me. What are you, 65? So they kind of make a joke about it. And I'm not saying that age differences are even a big deal. They have hot women chasing after these men as though nobody else on earth exists. It's sort of that whole King of Queens thing. Like, like sitcoms were always having that same formula of, I guess, blue collar looking men and these incredibly hot wives. Adam Sandler and all of his movies totally play into that. I instantly think of that uh, premiere photo where he's standing next to Selena Gomez and she's looking gorgeous and he's wearing literally like basketball shorts. Adam Sandler is always dressed like if you tried to make a Billie Eilish outfit from like Walmart clothes. They put in no effort compared to the female stars and all of the female characters look like either crazy, shrews, or evil bitches. There's a lot to unpack here. At first, Missy just seems like, you know, a little quirky, like she's being like, I give you this rose. Like she's very much just being, oh, I'm zany, wacky, you know, almost like Zoe Deschanel, but a little more swearing. Zoe Deschanel if she went to public school, you know? And then we get to this plot point that comes up a lot in the movie. I just don't drink, it's not that weird. People who don't drink? 
They always have a story. I don't have a story. Sorry to disappoint you. David Spade's character doesn't drink alcohol in the movie. At least that's what he says at the beginning. But then he continues to try to drink alcohol every time he gets stressed. Can I get you something to drink? Oh yeah, I'll have a tequila. Make it too. It seems like the writers and the director of this movie are trying to play to people with like a fifth grade level of intelligence who are somehow also adult men. I think what they really wanted to do here is let David Spade do what he does best, which is play the straight man, meaning the one who's totally normal in the crazy situation. So they kind of represent our outlook on it. But I'm tired of it. I'm tired of seeing it. You're getting your hair. Oh, am I? Oh, am I? Getting in. Oh, am I? Do you want to get it? Uh, uh, I don't think that's sanity. All of it feels so drawn out. They're like, okay, then we'll put you guys at a dinner table and you just have to do weird things to make him realize that you're crazy. And she's like, okay, I'll put this spoon over my eye. Okay, and we'll put that on a movie. That's the way it's gonna be. What I'm saying is you have to have a good script underneath, but this script was basically just three ideas strung together. This woman named Melissa, but everyone calls her Missy, obviously, is so weird that David Spade's character tries to climb out the bathroom window Window, but somehow, you know, she slides under the stall and is bothering him and saying like, we should hook up in here. I don't know if she's like sex crazed or just like socially inept. It seems like she's kind of both. She's somehow very immature, but she has all of these jobs and certifications. It's a lot to unpack. My friend, my protector, Sheila. What are you, Crocodile Dundee? What, it's a blind date. What if you were some psycho? Then I could behead you. Crocodile Dundee, like I'm just, that's when I realized, oh, this movie is made for men 40 plus who are like my dad, basically. Not that my dad likes bad movies, but it just reminds me of Adam Sandler's glory days, right? Where he was making Big Daddy, Happy Matt, Happy Gilmore. I guess there was like a few others in there where all of this humor kind of was still new. Tim falls out the window and like breaks his leg. And I started to get confused at this point because it feels like the scene is gonna go on even longer Longer, but then it just cuts to title. But you wish you had that tequila now, oh, huh, Tim? No, Don't worry, no, I'm a certified no, EMT. No, 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 no. You see those guys approaching them in the alleyway, but then basically the movie cuts to title card and we just see three months later. So a really abrupt time jump right off the bat. Why do these bad movies always seem to do that? They start us in the wrong place. One ninth of the whole movie is devoted to something that's just establishing stuff we could learn later. Did you see me dance a little bit? I was like, oh, I hate this movie, shake it out. So three months later, Tim is working at his banking job. They're very vague about what they do here. This is because they didn't really work it out fully. He's talking to his good friend who works at HR, who's played by Nick Swartzen. Swartzen? And I mean, uh, short list because you're short. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Really living up the best days of his comedy career, wouldn't you say? Like, they don't have to put every little improvised line in just to pad this out to be a feature film, but it feels like that's what they're doing here. When I was learning to write comedy, they always taught us, don't put it in the script if it's not making you laugh. People would read their comedy sketches and the professor would say, did you think that was funny when you wrote it? And they would be like, not really. So why did, would anyone else laugh? I feel like if you can't laugh at your own joke, who are you writing it for? then, people that you think are dumber than you, because then you're writing down to your audience. Adam Sandler, you don't get to talk down to me. I talk down to you. Look at your shorts, they're huge. The HR guy lets on that Tim has been obsessed over his ex-fiance, who we see on his screensaver, and already I'm like, oh yeah, another hot blonde woman who's engaged to you, even though you're 20 years older than her? Like, what does this guy have? Some sort of magic dust he puts on their pancakes in the morning? He's like, not only a little snivelly, he also doesn't seem to be very charming or charismatic. He's kind of the most boring person. I get that it sounds shallow, but I think what I have a problem with in these movies is that men get away with being awful and they're positioned as like the one that's desirable in the relationship. And then these women are always conniving or harping on the men. So it's really problematic for me in that way. And we haven't even gotten to all the points where Missy is violently harmed. She's basically just Super Mario in this bitch. But a prime example of this unequal matching is is when David Spade is in this airport and he bumps into another woman named Melissa, just like Missy, and they accidentally switch bags because they have the same bag and then they realize they're reading the same book. And this woman is played by Molly Sims. She's absolutely gorgeous and I just don't buy it. I would be more worried that he's a narc than that he's hitting on me. But because they both don't drink, it's fate. Really confusing messages on what they're even trying to say with this whole drinking storyline throughout. This movie is like they just had a big boiling pot of stew and 
and they were like, chop up some of this conflict, put a little of that trope in here, add a hot blonde with tan skin, get put her in a bikini, and we're going to Hawaii with a bunch of guys who can make some jokes on a boat. It's like, I really want to take a nap. Anyway, Tim and Melissa continue to hit it off by being the most curmudgeon -y old people you've ever seen on camera. I feel like they're just saying cliche obvious things about technology to try to appeal to this audience. By the way, I was supposed to see Phil Collins, right? And my friend talks me into the VR version. I'm not even talking to him anymore. It was not even close. I mean, those things suck. Yeah. I'm not happy unless I'm deaf for a week after a concert. Exactly. I feel like in movies, people toast more often than they do in real life. Like, you just said some words. I really like loud music. Me too. Also, since when does Phil Collins give you two options, come to my real life concert or my VR concert? No one said that that's an equivalent thing. Also, Phil Collins, it's like, okay, boomer. It's really trying hard to sell the narrative that I'm still hip, I'm still young, I still hook up with ladies in the broom closet of an airport. Like, I don't see someone David Spade's age doing any of this stuff. It's like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Later at his hotel, Tim texts back Melissa, who he thinks is the Melissa he just had a great time with at the airport. Report. But I could tell from the way that the response is written that this is clearly not the person he thinks it is. You know he's accidentally texting Missy right now. Movies have been trying since texting became a thing to try to make text messaging cinematic and they try to do it by putting it up on the screen in big letters. To me, I'm just like, boo, texting is boring. It's not cinematic. So, so far we've met Missy, we've met Melissa, and now we're gonna meet a few other female characters. Your Miss Wright was Miss Marilyn, two sport collegiate athlete. You girls gossiping about the Barracuda again? No, but we will when you leave because you're a psycho. In a Happy Madison production, women have to be either completely insane or hot and in love with you. There is no in-between. This woman who is a co-worker of Tim, her name is Jess. I'm not saying that this is a bad actor, but I do smell some nepotism in the air because Jess is played by Jackie Sandler. That's the wife of Adam Sandler. And it seems like basically every single member of Adam Sandler's family, except for Adam himself, made it into this movie. <laughs> Excuse me, I have the hiccups. Jess and Tim are up for the same job as the president of their company, so they're both trying to improve Jack Winstone, the old boss. Oh, right, so Nick Swartzen's character suggests to Tim, you've got to invite this crazy hot woman you met at the airport to our work retreat thing in Hawaii. It's also somehow the interview for the president job that, like, he's making the decision on the trip somehow. I recognize so many of the characters in this movie from other Happy Madison or Adam Sandler movies everybody gets a line like tell me what this adds to the movie as a whole can you do me a huge favor and check my breath for me okay one more time <sighs> smells good you eat dog this morning i'm just kidding you're good to go that scene was two minutes of my life that i'll never get back just down the toilet of so many toilets it just feels like a bunch of dad jokes to me this whole movie is like one unfunny dad joke after another and then in between that it's like and we hate your mother too dad's rule mom suck that's the message Adam Sandler's giving me. Then finally, Tim's date gets on the plane and shocker of the century. Everyone's surprised to find out that Missy is the one who sits down on the plane and he's like, huh, what are you doing here? So he checks the phone and realizes he's been texting Missy this whole time, not Melissa from the airport. But if you've been texting for a whole week and you invite someone to Hawaii with you, don't you jump on the phone real quick and talk and then he would have instantly known this is not the same person. Plus the way that she's texting back and forth is nothing like the person that he met at the airport, it sounds like Missy, who he met three months earlier. But instead of just explaining the situation and moving on with his life, we get this stupid reason why everything has to keep going forward. You're my savior. There I was, about to jump off the highest bridge in Portland, but I didn't because it was one hell of a first date and it was fate. Apparently, Missy was about to take her own life when that text comes through, and this manipulates Tim into being like, oh, I can't break it off with her. She's gonna go crazy. I get what they're trying to do here. I talk about this a lot, where they're trying to make the stakes clear. Suddenly, it's a life or death situation. He can't just get rid of this person, or he'll be responsible for her life. So he feels compelled to keep up this ruse. My problem with it is, later on in the movie, he blatantly tries to kill Missy several times. That's not hyperbole. He tries to let 
her die. And there are moments where he seems relieved that she's gonna be dead. So it's really shaky here. The whole basis of her coming along on the trip doesn't jive because he barely cares about her later on. Also, again, it just continues to support this narrative that all of the men are sane and normal people in a world of crazy women who just can't do anything right without them. This movie makes me have so many extra cells in my body. It's like I can feel my joints hurting. Once they arrive in Hawaii, I was immediately hit with another scene where I thought, hmm, that's curious why they would even put that in here. And then I did some sleuthing. If I see a sea turtle in that ocean, I am riding it! You can't ride the turtle. That's inappropriate. And disturbing. You're inappropriate and disturbing. Have respect for the island. Don't 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 even know me. You don't even know me. Why are the white friends from Gullah Gullah Island suddenly on here preaching about this beach? I was like, what? Who are these girls all of a sudden? And then I checked out the cast list. Oh, Lobby Strong Sadie and Lobby Strong Sunny are played by Sadie Sandler and Sunny Sandler. Why are you called Lobby Strong Sadie? I'm Lobby Strong, man. Basically, everyone in Adam Sandler's family gets to be in this movie. But my thing is, if you're writing in a bunch of little parts just to give people scenes, and they're not even real actors, that's gonna make your movie so boring. That doesn't add comedy to the movie, you know? It just adds noise. It adds children screaming in their little American Eagle shorts. And I'm not someone who doesn't like kids. I just don't like it when they're around me for too long. Because this is the world's busiest hotel lobby in the planet Earth, uh, we are immediately met with Rich, who is one of Tim's co-workers, who happens to be dating Tim's ex-fiance. Such an incestuous pool of all white people dating each other. Must be fun to live in that world if you love mayonnaise. You two, D do you have a history? These oh. two were freaking engaged. He was the guy before I I'm now the guy. We should get going, we're gonna be late. That there is Sarah Chalk, who I know from Scrubs. Also, she was on the same episode of the Sharon Osbourne show as me when I was 12. David Spade literally looks like Christopher Robin's dad in this, but they're like, every woman wants him, they can't help it. And to me, it's just like, why don't you cast a different actor other than David Spade in this? He's not funny. Happy Madison Productions is so stuck in their ways of giving parts to Rob Schneider, David Spade, Nick Swartzen, whoever that guy is, whoever that guy is, you know, it's just like all of these familiar faces that you're like, oh, they had one quote in a movie that I liked in the 90s. Actually, I guess it's the best thing for Happy Madison Productions to be just doing these Netflix originals because no one would go to a theater for this crap. And obviously people are watching like these have huge budgets, but also you'll notice Happy Madison movies tend to like to have like these exotic locations so that they can all hang out on the beach and shoot movies in the sun. Also, in a world where everybody seems to be like high functioning adults, they really try hard to make Make Missy seem like she's the craziest person on earth. I am Hellstar! Who dares to enter my lair? Like, we get it. She's quirky. It's just not funny. Like, it's just not funny to me. I mean, Lauren Lapkus is trying her best. She's carrying the line. She never once feels like she's not delivering it right, but I'm still not laughing. Are you laughing? Every time I laugh, it's like, ugh that kind of laugh, which is not a real laugh. At the test screening, they're like, yep, we got a laugh. It's like, that's an embarrassed chortle. We're like a half hour into the movie. We finally meet Jack Winstone, who is the boss that everyone's trying to impress on this trip so that David Spade can get the president's job. Coffee, sir. I didn't want a coffee. Oh, should I drink it? I don't care. Like, who is that guy? Oh, he's Adam Sandler's son. It's so crazy you can kind of see that he's related to Adam Sandler by that stupid smirk that he has. They're wasting their money and their time, and my time especially. Do you know how valuable my time is? I have things I could be doing. Sometimes I'll order two different flavors of frozen yogurt and then eat them subsequently, like ones in the freezer on deck. And that takes a lot of logistical planning and organization, but here I am watching Happy Madison Productions, ruining my whole Saturday. I'm not gonna stop at every unfunny joke in the movie, because we would be here not laughing all day, but I've just got to show you one more. My husband Paul was a guest jeans model. What do you model for now? Cinnabon? Huh? <laughs> Like, that's not funny. That's like the lowest hanging fruit you could ever find on the tree of comedy. There are maybe one or two things that Lauren Lapkus says that make me laugh, but it's really more like the exception to the rule. If I think of movies like Bridesmaids, I was laughing out loud every single scene, and that was still highly improvised. There's so much garbage in this movie that doesn't make sense, like that we don't need. For example, Missy starts going around and giving people like fortune telling readings. Seeing a little boy, his name's Calvin. Yes, that's Cale Jr. 
I'm Cal Senior. You're visualizing my son. Standing next to your grave. At this point, my brain doesn't have any more room for another character, okay? I've got Missy, Melissa, the ex-girlfriend, the barracuda lady at work, the boss, all of these co-workers. Like, I don't need to know this guy's name or what his son's name is. Are you kidding me right now? Are you joking me? Are you looking me in the eye and putting this really on Netflix? Next time you're gonna add another cameo in, think to yourself, hmm, what matters more? Do I need to maintain my relationship with every over 40 character actor in Hollywood? Or do I need to make a movie that won't have people swimming out into the ocean and drowning themselves? Were you laughing? No, maybe you will when we, when we hammer it even deeper into your brain. You're gonna lose a leg in 10 years in a horrific motorcycle accident. The authorities will find it, they'll put it on backwards and you're gonna be <laughs> I don't care. That was probably improvised too because it wasn't funny. I get that it's a running joke throughout the whole movie that Missy is trained in everything. She's like, oh, I'm an addiction counselor. I'm a life coach. I'm a marriage counselor. I'm a palm reader. But it also kind of seems like she's making all of it up or like she would be one to make it up, but I guess she is really smart. Her character just isn't fully thought through for me because she's not a real woman. This is not someone with their own motivations or story. They're just there because they're blatantly obsessed with David Spade's character from the minute that they saw each other, which I also don't understand because he's not admirable at all. Because of Tim's bragging about this Miss Maryland he was bringing, everyone thinks that Missy is like a collegiate athlete. And she says, oh, I told that Barracuda lady that I was gonna jump off this cliff. I feel like they're trying to do this whole Mrs. Doubtfire thing all of a sudden where they're like, oh, we're maintaining this false story for the person that I brought to the event. So it's like the fake date trope that we have in a lot of sitcoms. However, we don't get any of that built-in suspense. Anyway, here's an image of a woman violently getting injured. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Don't think I've ever seen anyone dive in the ocean and miss. Who says such a thing when you think you just saw somebody die? Also, why was she ever going to jump off of this cliff, which clearly has like yards and yards of sandy beach before the water even starts? Also, somehow she survives this. So it kind of messes up the stakes a little more for me because wasn't she gonna jump off like an equally high distance at the beginning of the movie? But I guess she's Superman. The boss is having them all go on a shark sighting trip as one of his many tactics to find out who's the right guy for the job, who can swim with the sharks, which is just like no business on earth would ever do anything like this. Tim tries to sneak out and go on this trip without Missy, which is just so boring. Like they do this again and again in the movie where he's like, I hope she doesn't come. And then the very next scene. You know when you just let somebody drown and then try to keep it a secret? This is the guy who felt so bad that she was gonna end her own life at the beginning of the movie. Like, the whole reason she's here is so that she won't take her own life, and yet he's willing to let her drown any chance he gets. The movie doesn't want you to remember all these little details, and maybe you don't consciously remember them, but that's why as I'm watching it, I'm like, I can't get into this. Also, Missy seemed completely oblivious, like she's being blatantly ignored and ditched throughout this whole movie. And she just acts like it's not happening. Is she a self-aware person who's really like unapologetic about who she is, which is I think what they try to shoehorn in? Or is she just like an oblivious, you know, woman with maybe like limited cognitive abilities? What are we supposed to laugh at here? Rob Schneider gets one of his bit parts in this. Here's this formula for making a funny character in a Happy Madison production. A physical injury or some sort of difference in the body caused by an accident. Perhaps a contact that makes your eye look the other way Way, or a missing limb in this case. Hey, if you see the shark that did this to me, you tell him from me. What's up? What's up, baby? Excuse me, I gotta take this. What's up? What is this two-fingered Beetlejuice character we're getting from him? It makes me want to cry in my soul. My soul goes when. Missy uses her knife to chop up some fish, which is really sad. Basically, for reasons that are so dumb, I won't repeat them, they end up getting attacked by a CGI shark, which looks awful. The whole shark attack scene is such a waste of my energy. There's no continuity. I don't get why this is happening. It wasn't funny. It wasn't scary. This literally feels like the adult version of the kind of movies you put on in the living room to babysit a child so that they just sit there and look like that. 
and I just want to be like, can you close your mouth and breathe through your nose? Thank you, Tommy. After the boat trip, Tim gets a text from the real Melissa who he intended to invite and she's like, hey, remember me? And he's like, oh my God. And it, he through text explains the whole thing that happened, which is so boring. Why couldn't it be a phone call? I'm just saying, make things a phone call when they can be a phone call. It's much more cinematic because I don't want to see someone doing this. I would rather hear them doing this. How is that even supposed to be funny? Also, I hate it when someone's face is covered in mud or dirt in a movie and you can see like the perfect outline of where they didn't want to go close to the eyes. Just takes me out of it every time. It happens a lot. Feather those edges, baby girl, feather them. Suddenly, he's all nervous because he realized that she, <sighs> Oh, I'm getting so annoyed talking about this movie. <laughs> I'm so bored talking about it. I hated this movie so much. I don't know. I wish it were even more like, what? It just sucks. This movie sucks. So Tim and his friend panic because they realize that Missy has gone on a spa day with the unseen wife of Mr. Winstone, the boss. I don't know why we never meet the wife of the boss. Like, I mean, we meet every other character in this movie. Maybe they're like, we put too many shrew-like women on camera for this movie. We have a maximum of four. So everyone else has to be a chubby dude with an attitude. But anyway, afterwards, Missy is like, oh yeah, I told her she could dump that guy because he's a jerk. That's your boss? So it's like this big force conflict that everyone is like, oh, that's gonna be a big issue, even though it never really becomes one. And we get this reveal. The other day you told me you're gonna jump off a bridge. Yeah, that's what you do when you go bungee jumping. Anybody else wanna do this? I'm bailing! I got your text and I was like, I'm not gonna do anything dangerous ever again because I am loved by someone. Okay, but you literally jumped off of a cliff to help that person keep up a lie he was telling earlier. So nothing makes sense. Tim makes Missy go fix whatever she did with the boss, which she does by going back and doing that Hellstar thing where she's being weird with her hair. They should have given this actress more to do to be funny and weird than to put her hair in her mouth. That's kind of where she was limited, I would say. If they really wanted to flesh out this character, I would probably have given her even more physical things to do, like maybe she has weird nervous tics or she has a bird that she brings with her and keeps on her shoulder. For some reason, Missy is also a chiropractor, so she fixes the boss's neck when he hurts it. And then that night off screen, she mends the marriage and they're finally happy again. And she's like, don't worry, your boss loves you now. I don't know why we keep seeing stuff like this happen off screen. I just want one interesting thing to happen during this movie and they're not giving it to me. And at this point, we're only 30 minutes from the end of it. So you can imagine nothing good's gonna happen at this point. From, from now on, we're pretty much screwed. Which is why I'll take a minute to tell you more about this shirt that I'm wearing from Ripped Apparel. It says, I survived Midsommar Festival. It's from one of my favorite horror movies, Midsommar. But Ripped Apparel has tons of t-shirts about pop culture, movies, geeky and nerdy things as well. And they add new designs every day. You can find lots of other accessories and cool stuff. So you can check it out in the link below. They've got $7 tees you can look at, but that's an affiliate link. So, you know, I'll make a commission if you buy anything. Just letting you know. Finally, it's the night of the talent show. I don't know what kind of company has a talent show to decide their new president, but apparently this is both talent show and somehow an interview to decide who gets the job. Also, another layer of conflict that they might have just decided to put in here is that if Tim gets the job, he gets to bring his whole team. And if the other lady, Jessie, gets the job, she gets to bring her whole team. All of Tim's friends' jobs are at stake unless he gets the job. Again, that's not really how things work in the world, but this is the Happy Madison world where everything sucks more. Tim and his team are doing this shadow dancing thing, which again, I feel like they just pulled names out of a hat and were like, that could be funny. This movie also has kind of forgetting Sarah Marshall vibes, although again, that was a superior film. That's right, we have the nation's best short. Come on, here it comes. Best, best short term loan. Oh, that's good. Mr. Winstone seems really into this whole performance and something seems a little curious. He's like almost too enthusiastic. The whole shadow dance thing is just completely miserable to watch. They try to make jokes about someone shooting lemons out of their butt. <sighs> that's where we're at. Like this movie, it's just, wor it's making me ill. You hypnotized him? I found the one thing Jack has an undying love for. It's Nana. When he sees you, 
Easy's Nana. So among all of these things, stupid, what's her name, Missy is, I know I hate a movie when I don't even want to remember their names because I keep forgetting. Missy is also a hypnotist amongst everything else. And they have this really fictional version of hypnotism where the boss thinks that Tim is his Nana now. They lean on this device for a good portion of the movie. But then we see Jessie do her performance for the talent show. And we're supposed to like, I don't know what we're supposed to think of this, but I actually think it's more interesting and fun than Tim's shadow dancing thing. We've got choreography, costume changes, auto-tune. This is everything I need from a halftime performance. Women rule the world. Women are the enemy in this movie. Why do they hate women? Here's a part of the movie that actually made me laugh. I think there were maybe three total. The other ones were kind of things that Lauren Lapkus said, but this was one of the only scripted ones. I love this guy. You make me feel safe. I hope you never die. But now I'm watching it a second time and I'm not laughing, so that lasted long. They have like a cartoon or a sitcom take on hypnotism where you can literally make somebody think they're talking to a different person. Which even for a wacky comedy like this, I feel like it's so played out. There's just like nothing unique about this movie. Everything feels derivative of something else. Because of the hypnotism, Tim wins the talent show. And that's when Tim starts to see Missy a little differently. And you can see he's starting to be like, you're such an amazing woman which really only happens because what she did something he needed he basically acts like she's repulsive the whole movie until she helps him get what he wants which I think is really cool for someone who looks like you're wearing princess Diana wig you got a lot of nerve interestingly almost as soon as he starts to see Missy as a romantic interest she starts acting a lot less crazy and weird and starts being more of a normal woman which for me is like we didn't even get a glimpse of these normal charming things throughout the movie and now all of a sudden she's acting like a completely average character who would be very attractive to someone. When my dad passed away, I was kind of lonely. Signed up for a bunch of stuff and kind of became a jack of all trades. That's nice. Okay, but where did she learn to be a freaking weirdo? Because that's also a big part of her personality. There's a scene where Tim is picking up weed from Nick Swardson's character. I do have weed toothpaste, weed deodorant, weed chapstick, weed hair growth, mm -hmm. foam. I just feel like you can tell this was written by a 50 year old man, right? They don't make all of those types of products that can get you high. It's like screwball comedy for people whose brains are dying. Like if you really wanna just sit down and chuckle at something while the frontal lobe of your brain starts to atrophy, this is a great option for you. They get the weed toothpaste and he and Missy use it along with Sarah Chalk's character who ends up in the bedroom cause she's like, we need to have closure. Let's all have a three way together because that that will help us all move on, which I'm just like, where does Sarah Chalk's character even come from? What is it that she sees in David Spade's character though? In the whole movie, they're trying to make it seem like he's this boring guy, his only friend is the Grubhub delivery guy, and he's pathetic and he's a loser. But so then why does everyone find him attractive? Why was he also found attractive by Melissa at the airport and Sarah Chalk, who is his ex-fiance? There's just, I don't get it. It would have made more sense if they had shown that Sarah Chalk's character had no interest in him and then as she watched like Missy and him interact, she was started to see, oh, he's a great guy. But instead she seems more impressed by Missy and that brings her into the room. Anyway, the next day they go to a pig roast and they realize it's been turned into a kid's birthday party because the boss, Mr. Winstone, has suddenly become a cartoon character. Well, he was hypnotized. They told him to throw away the restraints of adulthood. Mr. Winstone's conducting interviews in the ocean. So now they're having actual interviews on this vacation at the pig roast party. Why is this the workplace from the Brady Bunch. Everything feels so sitcom -y. Out of jealousy, Jessie, the evil girl, lets on to Missy that she's not even the one who's supposed to be here. And that leads Missy to look at Tim's phone, which is for some reason completely unlocked, and sees the text telling the other Melissa, oh, I invited the wrong girl. She's a lunatic. This is crazy. Even though this was all sent right before before Tim started to actually fall for her. This might sound like a familiar third act conflict because it is, it happens in every movie where it's like, at first it was just to get the job, but then I really started to feel for you. So in that way, I feel like the third act conflict is competent at least because they basically copied it right from another movie. So Missy gets mad and she storms off right as Melissa, played by the hot one, shows up and she's like, I got the next plane out here to spend the week with you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Sorry about the mix up. Which to me, I'm just like, does 
does nobody here have a job or a life that they need to attend to? Oh, I'm gonna fly and meet some guy in Hawaii that I met at the airport two weeks ago. That's how people end up murdered on Dateline, Missy, okay? I would actually welcome a murder if that would happen in this movie. It would give it some spice. Murder me. I think I forgot to mention at one point, but Missy finally hears the reason why Tim doesn't drink. He said, oh, in college years ago, I drank a bunch of tequila and I did a handstand and I was walking on my hands. And she was like, really? That's not so crazy. And he's like, well, I walked off my frat house's roof. And that's the reason he never drank again, which to me is not as bad as I would have thought. While he's having dinner with Melissa, he is basically distracted and misses Missy and is drinking shots the whole time. So apparently the walking on hands thing is just something he does every time he gets drunk. That's what this would have you believe. Look at you, walking away on your hands. Just the corners. Go, go. Ah! You know when you fall two stories and literally bounce off the ground? Yeah, me either. That doesn't happen, because then you would survive. These movies are really playing fast and loose with the physical comedy. In case you were worried about these romantic entanglements and the love triangle that we're experiencing here, I wouldn't think too hard about it. I met somebody else and she's loud and she's borderline psychotic. She carries a knife, but I think I'm falling in love with her. I don't know, but I'm sorry. It's all good. I mean, we made out in a janitor's closet. I think I'll be okay. See, this feels so unearned for me. David Spade is like, oh, I got that thing that I was searching for the whole movie and I don't want it. And that can happen. I mean, other movies have done this, but I feel like they work a little harder for it. For example, he's set with the idea of Melissa being his dream girl the whole time because they read the same books and they like the same music and they both both hate computers. But then what if after all of that work where he finally gets her, he starts to realize that she's not everything he built her up to be. Maybe for example, she has a really boring response to questions that Missy had a really interesting or funny response to. Or maybe something happens that Missy would have reacted in a way that's really empowering. Like for instance, someone is rude to them at the restaurant and she stands up for herself. As opposed to Melissa who is a little more coy about it and just lets things happen to her. And then throughout that meal, we could see David Spade be like, oh, this is not everything that I thought it was. I was learning to love life when I was with Missy. Then I could buy a little bit more that he was like, I'm gonna get drunk and get out of here. But instead, he basically regrets the decision from the second Missy leaves. And it, for me, a little better, the emotional payoff is more interesting if Missy leaves and then he realizes that what he wanted was in front of him the whole time. But the movie doesn't actually care about giving you an interesting progression to the story. They just want you to laugh at all of the jokes. He just goes from loving one female character to another, and the only thing all of these women have in common is that they are obsessed with him for no reason. There's a lot of text position that goes on in the next montage where basically David Spade is texting after the vacation being like, please take me back, Missy, and she's like, no. He unhypnotizes his boss and gets fired, which I don't know why that even matters or who that's helping. But then he hatches a plan to finally meet up with Missy on another blind date, just like the one that they met at the beginning. And David David Spade gives his home monologue about all of the change he's experienced in the last two seconds. I want to go out and be free. I want to be fun. I want to be unapologetic about who I am. I want to carry a machete. I want to, I want to be like you. Yeah, it really seemed like you wanted to be like her when you were openly admonishing everything she did throughout the whole movie until the shadow dance. Like if you wanted to sell me on the fact that he was learning to be more out there and love life, I didn't really get that he was such a buttoned up guy before. I got that maybe he was hung up on his ex fiance, but they could have definitely sold that a little more throughout the movie. They could have been like showing him start to loosen up a little bit or had his coworker be like, oh, Mr. Type A over here, he would never get in a shark tank. And then Missy convinces him to do it. Instead, everything was just like happening to him. And now all of a sudden he like flips on a dime that he really loves Missy. It's so dumb and I don't like it. I'm smiling because I hate it. And then they kiss like, and then the movie's over. It's like two hours of nothing happened. It was seriously just an excuse for all of that cast and crew to get on a boat and go to Hawaii. I don't like this, I don't like this too much. What do you guys think of The Wrong Missy, a case of mistaken identity that just is so funny? I absolutely loathe this movie. I thought there was nothing redeeming about it except for maybe a few funny points that 
accidentally made their way in. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments below and let me know what movies I should watch next to cover up in another clip breakdown. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every single week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first one in the shark tank with me, baby. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for calling the wrong Missy with me today. I will see you next time.